Well, I want to thank Erner Berry for letting us be a part of this uh, conversation and um, certainly some interesting times that we're in. And um, I'm going to share some thoughts that we at MetLife Investment Management have regarding uh, the stock market and the food industry. So um, spend a little time today talking about uh, um, the disconnect between the economy and overall GDP growth and the rally in the stock market that uh, happened in record time. And then think about how that uh, matters to food firms that are part of the um, publicly traded companies. So thinking about um, not just uh, food retailers or food processors, but also those uh, firms that are in the entire value chain and how they've performed uh, over this period of COVID-19. And then uh, ask to think a little bit about the future of stock performance um, and what can companies do to really grow uh, their stock price and perform well in the, in the marketplace. And, you know, almost entirely the stock price is determined by the future and what investors see as the opportunities out um, for a company to be able to grow their uh, profits and be able to share that with shareholders. So, you know, to get started, just want to think about um, the, the S&P 500 recovery was the fastest ever from a bear market to um, a new record high. Uh, the Dow hasn't recovered to its record high, but it's pretty close and it bounces around very close to that. And so the stock market recovery is pretty remarkable when you consider the steep declines in gross domestic product that have occurred and economic activity in general has uh, pulled back pretty substantially. So, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that the stock market measures a different phenomenon than GDP overall measures. While the two uh, measures are related, they're not exactly perfect substitutes for each other. So, um, and in particular, when you look at the S&P 500 recovery, a large part of that has been driven by um, some tech stocks that are performing very well in this environment and are, prob and are likely benefiting um, from some of the changes in behavior that we've experienced as part of uh, uh, shutting down the parts of the economy for the COVID-19. So um, right now, those uh, tech firms account for a very large share of the S&P 500 on the order of 25% of the total value of the S&P 500 is in Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, which is now known as Alphabet. Um, and their substantial recovery has really driven the S&P 500 to its record highs again. Um, and so, you know, con contrast that to the overall economy and in particular Main Street economy, where we see a lot of pullback in retail spending, particularly on the restaurant side, we see folks having pulled back pretty substantially, either because uh, location, localities, cities have uh, shut down dine-in restaurants or uh, folks who really are just choosing to uh, isolate and um, not participate in those activities. So, um, you know, think about other parts of the economy, such as uh, uh, gasoline hasn't recovered, so we haven't uh, seen traveling uh, recover fully. That's impacting, travel is also impacting uh, airlines and public transport. And so those things really, um, while they contribute to S&P 500, they're not um, being driven by these large tech stocks uh, in the same way. So um, if we think about this recovery in terms of food companies, so we pulled together um, a few indexes to really try and get a, a sense of how different parts of the food value chain are performing in this uh, environment. So you can see um, the overall US GDP has really uh, ticked down. Um, and the S&P 500 in uh, mid-March crashed pretty substantially and dived into bear market territory and has since recovered uh, and is above um, where it started the year in January. So you can contrast that to some of the different food sectors and what the overall reaction has been. In general, you can see um, most of the food value chain players experienced the same decline and recovery, um, but in different orders. So let's take a look and dive into each of these sectors and, and see what we're talking about. So we didn't grab every single uh, publicly traded firm in these different categories, but tried to pick a few key ones that would give us a sense of what's going on overall um, and looked at the value chain and different components. So uh, food processors are those uh, companies that manufacture the brands that you know well um, Kellogg's, Hormel Foods, Tyson, uh, 
being the largest producer of uh, protein products in the country. We did break out uh, dining uh, for fast food versus dine-in restaurants. And the key there was, you know, the, the fast food restaurants likely were in a position to um, sustain a bit of a hit on dine-in because it had uh, carry out or drive through options that were pretty typical. And um, a company like Domino's, you know, pizza has had a long history of being delivered. So wanted to contrast that to dine-in restaurants like um, Texas Roadhouse and the uh, brands that Darden and Brinker both have, where the bulk of their uh, revenue in the past had been from folks coming in, sitting down, dining, um, and for a lot of them, they were either uh, closed by the local governments or they uh, chose to close. So um, contrast those two uh, retail, food retail, food restaurant sectors, and then compare that to grocers. So, you know, an opportunity for Kroger where uh, when folks pull back on, on restaurant spending, they still need to consume calories and so still going to spend at restaurants and see what the impact has been there. Uh, further back in the value chain, taking a look closer to the farm gate. Uh, before the farm gate, we were looking at some ag input suppliers such as Corteva, which provides seed, insecticide, herbicides, and fungicides to farmers. Agco and John Deere providing uh, uh, machinery power, obviously. And so how did they stack up? And then just outside the farm gate, those first handler grain processors, how did ADM and Bungie fare um, as commodity market volatility spiked uh, as well. So if we dive into the index, the first one we're taking a look at here is grocery stores or food retailers, uh, and they really weren't impacted at all. If you think about um, most of the S&P 500 uh, decline was here in mid-March, uh, grocery stores actually moved in the opposite direction. Uh, and we saw, you know, prior to COVID, roughly half of consumers spending on food was half at home, so half at grocery stores and half away from home, so at restaurants or food service. Um, you know, and a large part of that food away home option became unavailable to consumers and we near, shifted nearly all of that through grocery stores. And it certainly had created some short-term pain, some short-term uh, shortages. So we saw, you know, on the food side, we saw shortages at the meat counter. We saw shortages of some of those pantry items folks stuck, stocked up on, such as beans, flour, uh, sugar, perhaps, um, but also on just household goods, things like uh, paper towels, for the paper uh, were stocked out for a period of time early in the pandemic. So um, while grocery stores had challenges with uh, supply chain to the logistics, generally speaking, they were able to respond pretty quickly and able to restock those shelves um, so that nobody was truly out of uh, stock of most of those goods. And since then, uh, grocery has performed pretty well. They've been able to uh, sustain those gains and folks um, continue to make large purchases. You know, I think the challenge here is uh, if the story were the other way and the economy were booming, the, the food retailers probably wouldn't follow that in the other direction. So it's a pretty steady sector and unlikely to have uh, big swings related to the overall market. Uh, if we move just a step back, so those brands that uh, you see in the grocery stores, how did they fare in this time? And pre-COVID, there was a lot of discussion that many of these brands uh, were struggling to meet changing consumer preferences. Many of them had built reputations on highly processed foods that were shelf stable, that um, maybe appealed to uh, folks' preferences for sweet foods. Um, and they were struggling to meet uh, the demands for fresh food, uh, healthy, more nutritious food. Um, and so some eyes were on that as folks returned to sort of what we call the center of the grocery store where those uh, retailers' brands are typically found, um, there might be some opportunity for them to win consumers back. So as folks stocked up on um, crap dinner or, um, you know, other product and cereals that folks are familiar with, um, could they sustain that momentum? At this point, they haven't made it all the way back to where they were in January collectively as a group. So um, still some concern about their ability to win back consumers long term and the sustainability of that. You know, I think one notable example that is high profile because of the um, 
the involvement of Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway is the Kraft Heinz merger. Um, it's dramatically underperformed relative to what uh, Warren Buffett's expectations were for that merger and continues to struggle to be able to deliver. And uh, even in the last month, they talk about uh, selling off additional brands, pairing back to really focus on their core, uh, which in the long run could be a good thing for that company and shareholders, but in the short run uh, has created some pain. And it appears based on our analysis that uh, food processors continue to um, be challenged with winning over consumers with their offerings. Um, and so they'll have some work to do going forward. You know, if we jump back now to really the consumer facing part of the value chain, fast food versus restaurants, taking a look at how they've been performing, um, it always seemed likely that uh, those restaurants built in a way that allows for quick carry out and for meals that uh, do well being carried out, that they would be positioned to be successful. So uh, early on in mid-March, they also experienced a steep decline in stock prices, but have since recovered and are um, doing really well, actually, relative to um, other parts of the value chain. So they're about 110% of the value they were in January. Um, lots of opportunities here uh, for these companies to improve their performance. So as you think about consumers, um, at some point in time, they will return to wanting some convenience um, and this will provide that convenience without the potential for exposure to uh, COVID-19. Um, so, you know, and they have made investments to help improve um, stores that maybe weren't well situated for it to be ready to do more carry out business as a share of revenue. So um, appear to be well positioned going forward. This is in stark contrast to uh, the dine-in restaurants. So um, you know these companies experienced the steepest declines. I mean, they were off 70% of their uh, stock price in mid-March. They have since somewhat recovered as the economy has opened back up. Uh, and some of them have reorganized uh, their their locations to be able to do more carry out dining. It's um, clearly not drive through, but is um, a challenge in terms of being ready to do curbside pickup. So um, they still haven't uh, made it back to where they were, but they have made some pretty substantial um, gains in their stock price since they bottomed out in mid March. If we think about those. Uh, companies that supply to agricultural producers, to farmers, um, so the John Deere's and the Cortevas of the world, um, they also experienced decline early on in the, in the market and then uh, have been able to recover. So they are on a similar trajectory as the fast food restaurants. Um, they've been able to recover largely because uh, of the essential nature of food production uh, that I think was recognized in acts of the administration and Congress. So really as part of the relief efforts, there was uh, plenty of support for agricultural producers to help them weather the storm and to be able to continue to deliver the world's largest, safest, most abundant, uh, and least lowest cost uh, food supply in the history of, in the history of humans. So, um, you know, in particular, one company that has really uh, performed well here, that's John Deere. They have a new CEO. They seem to have a new strategy that investors are reacting well to. And so that's helped uh, drive this somewhat. Dan Corteva is a relatively new company, a spin-off of the Dow DuPont merger, uh, a pure agricultural play company that has uh, been able to deliver uh, on some of its early strategy promises here in uh, a challenging growing season. And finally, if we look at grain processors, you know, that part of the value chain between farmers and uh, and consumers, um, they have struggled to retain uh, their stock performance uh, throughout COVID. So they're off about 50% there in the mid-March, uh, have recovered somewhat, but are struggling um, really, you know, and, and I think a few factors probably driving this for these companies. One is um, uncertainty about trade. So most of these companies are large global multinational companies and uh, uncertainty around trade uh, adds volatility to the commodity markets, adds volatility to their own markets that they sell to. And so that's been a challenge for them. So um, there's opportunity there for them to continue to improve on stock price. One other thing that maybe isn't as obvious 
you know, just when you think about a particular company or a particular sector, it's easy to consider some pretty specific um, functions or actions taken to improve the performance of the company. Um, but one macro factor that's really driving some of this um, is the actions of the Federal Reserve. So monetary policy um, going to have a pretty big impact on interest rates and uh, will impact the stock market. So as you think about um, the dramatic efforts taken both by the Federal Reserve as well as the federal government to support incomes and to support markets during the COVID-19 pandemic that really want to keep um, the economy going as much as it can and for the parts that need to shut down, um, not close them down permanently, but, but keep them in a place where they're ready to return. Um, you know, early on, there was some discussion that GDP would have a V-shaped recovery, if it would have a U-shaped recovery, more of a like a shaped recovery, um, a W recovery, if we had, you know, a, a sudden second burst of COVID infections that might cause lockdowns and another substantial decline in GDP. Um, right now, folks have been talking about a K-shaped recovery in terms of some parts of the economy, tech sector in particular, doing well and so climbing, while other parts of the economy, more mainstream focused, uh, struggling. So, you know, you, the, the, federal, the federal government stepped in with substantial support for consumers as well as uh, businesses to keep folks on payroll. But on the Fed side, they've taken some pretty extraordinary actions to make sure um, the markets continue to function. So, you know, as an overall balance sheet, the Federal Reserve balance sheet has dramatically increased. Uh, you see in 2007, the first um, substantial growth in the Federal Reserve balance sheet as a response to the global financial crisis. Um, by the end of 2017, they had started to taper back on some of those purchases to really let some of their commitments roll off. And then um, as the COVID pandemic set in, the Federal Reserve stepped in, continued to um, um, make some pretty substantial purchases to make sure liquidity stayed in the markets. So that has impacted uh, the yield curve. So you can see how the yield curve has changed since um, January. So here we're looking at interest rates over time. So uh, how costly is it to borrow money for one month versus borrow money for 30 years? Typically, when we borrow money further out into the future, we would anticipate that it has um, a higher cost relative to money we promise to repay at the end of the month. So um, yield curve typically curving upwards. You can see that the Federal Reserve stepped in to really drive short-term borrowing costs down to almost zero. Uh, and some uh, central banks, they have driven uh, short-term costs to negative, so negative interest rates, um, which never manifest themselves really for borrowers. Those are more um, incentives for banks and lenders to get money out into the hands of businesses. Um, but not often are they uh, paying borrowers to take uh, cash. So, um, but zero interest rates uh, for the Federal Reserve are, are a lift to the economy in terms of helping investors take that cash and deploy it out into projects. So, um, you know, they continue to uh, make decisions that help uh, keep that um, yield curve below where it was in January and have a commitment to keep interest rates low uh, until inflation starts to respond. So thinking about the Federal Reserve and their two mandates to keep unemployment relatively low and inflation relatively low and predictable, the challenge has been inflation has been too low for their preference. They target 2% inflation and uh, the Federal Reserve has now said they want to average 2% rather than uh, react when it gets to 2%. So that means they'll probably move, they'll keep interest rates low until inflation moves past um, 2% for a period of time. Um, so they, they've injected a substantial amount of money uh, into the economy. So the money supply has dramatically increased uh, relative to last year, and that helps keep uh, liquidity in the marketplace, helps keep interest rates down. Um, some might be concerned that inflation will follow with uh, so many dollars in the marketplace chasing so few goods. Um, but so far for this period of time, um, the inflation has remained under control and the U.S. dollar remains strong. So, you know, at the farm gate, the U.S. dollar really matters because 
farmers, the, the agricultural production that happens in the U.S., about 25% is exported. So a strong dollar makes U.S. exports uh, less competitive relative to international markets and so um, could impact farmers. Uh, in terms of food companies, probably uh, particularly those that are only domestically based, less relevant to them. Um, but in general, the dollar has remained strong despite the expanded monetary supply. And so, um, you know, where are those additional dollars in the economy going that explains why inflation has kept relatively low? And I think this is something that a lot of economists are paying attention to right now. Um, the stimulus that the government sent, so the support that the government put into the um, market, um, into consumers' hands, uh, some of that was spent, but a part of it was saved. And so consumers still uncertain about reemployment opportunities, going to sock away some money to really weather a longer storm than maybe um, a V-shaped recovery would have delivered. So, um, you know, to the extent folks take those additional dollars and then just save them, uh, that's going to help keep a lid on inflation because those dollars aren't out there chasing goods uh, and driving up prices. Um, so the last thing we were asked to think about is how, you know, what are some things that companies can do to improve stock performance? What does the future look like for food uh, companies? And I think, um, you know, really the durability of some of the behavior changes that we saw during COVID-19 will drive um, some of the opportunities for food companies in the future. So, um, you know, will consumers ultimately uh, make decisions to continue eating at home? I think given the, the steady march to away from home dining before COVID-19, it would be surprising not to see that kind of behavior return. I think uh, additionally, food companies have some opportunities to cater to evolving consumer preferences. And, you know, consumers are becoming much more choosy across a lot of different considerations, um, how their food is grown, where their food is grown, who grows their food, um, who processes their food, what's in their food. Um, so lots of opportunities to really uh, cater to those consumer preferences. And then, you know, cost saving and improved efficiency in a in a pretty steady industry like food processing and food delivery um, probably, you know, have as much opportunity to deliver a profit growth as sales growth does. And so, um, you know, when you think about institutional investors like MetLife Investment Management, um, they're really thinking about the long term and how can we generate um, some pretty steady cash flows across all periods. And I think you know, food firms in that regard are very attractive because a company like Campbell's Soup isn't delivering, you know, 10 or 15 percent growth a year like some of the tech companies, but it is delivering a very steady dividend and a very steady um, cash flow that uh, investors can count on. And so if you think about some of the preferences that investors have, one might be for growth. So as we're young and getting started and reinvest in our retirement accounts, we want that money to grow. We don't want to pull it out every period. And so they're really focused on growth stocks that they'll take earnings and reinvest them and continue to grow. As opposed to, you know, our, our grandparents or, or folks that are retired, they are looking to live off of that uh, investment. So they want that cash flow to come in with a uh, pretty good predictability and pretty good frequency. And so that's saying for some of the institutional investors is to think about how to re um, allocate investments to get the best of both of those worlds. So um, I think one thing that has been surprising to others is I've visited about a shift from dining out to dining at home is actually the USDA, uh, United States Department of Agriculture Research Service suggests that we actually eat healthier diets when we dine at home rather than dine, it out, dine out. You know, and to the extent that fast food is a large part of dining out and hamburgers and french fries don't contain a whole lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, it shouldn't be surprising when we return uh, to home consumption that those things make up a larger share. And I think uh, for food firms, this is an important part because, uh, as I noted earlier, the food uh, processing, those that make the brands that we are aware of, um, have really struggled to deliver on some of those fresh uh, food opportunities. And so this is a place where um, the degree to which consumption at home is durable 
will influence the way that companies are able to uh, really deliver value to the customer. So uh, one maybe notable thing here is during the global financial crisis, um, you know, food away from home declined, food at home increased, alcoholic beverages as a share of food expenditures remain pretty pretty steady. And I think that's been true through COVID-19 as well, even though uh, folks aren't out at the pubs and the um, bars, we do see folks uh, stocking up the liquor cabinet at home. So, um, you know, I think this, this data on this slide comes from Yelp, and it really is about what do we see uh, happening uh, at a particular part of the value chain outside of the publicly traded companies. So even um, for our small businesses, for our restaurants, uh, pretty substantial number of closures um, during COVID-19, and more than half of those are likely to be sustained out into the long run. So um, unfortunately, in this metric, the restaurants are um, ahead of their peers and other small service-oriented businesses like uh, beauty and spas and fitness. So um, really a challenge for restaurants going forward and um, going to be a challenge to see the vibrancy of, uh, you know, local restaurants that we had seen prior to this. Um, the restaurant change likely are in a better position to weather the storm, but uh, certainly the publicly traded companies haven't been immune from bankruptcy for restaurants either. Um, you know, I would mentioned some shifting in consumer preferences. This is just one way that consumer preferences have shifted over time. The way that we grow our food is of interest to them. Uh, and so they're looking for organic products. They're looking for reduced food miles. They're looking for a smaller carbon footprint. They're looking for uh, meat from animals who are humanely treated. These are all changing consumer preferences that allow companies an opportunity to grow revenues at the margin and really tailored to customers. And it would be remiss not to note that, uh, particularly on the protein side, some pretty substantial innovation happening there around uh, plant-based proteins or lab-grown meats, um, Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, and what those uh, opportunities for growth um, in the marketplace are. So, um, you know, this is all, all things that all parts of the food value chain are paying attention to. The other thing that might happen is in the food value chain, we're trying to get the consumer closer to farmer. And so that'll influence the way the value chain functions as well. You know, the problems related to um, meat processing, that being an environment where COVID-19 really had a pretty substantial outbreak, closed some plants for a period of time. Um, that is something that uh, has given consumers and the market in general some concern about how sustainable uh, it is to have so few highly efficient plants um, instead of maybe having a little less efficiency, but a little bit more um, slack in the system to be able to respond to these challenges. Um, you know, and then maybe one last consideration to think about going forward, particularly on the food retail side, is how does uh, e-commerce spending change the marketplace? So um, clearly in the COVID-19 environment, uh, a dramatic spike in the amount of on, online retail of groceries. Um, some have suggested that will come back um, once you know COVID-19 and the pandemic is under control. People like to shop. They like to squeeze their uh, melons. And so, you know, will they continue to sustain this online purchases, or will they revert back to going to brick and mortar for retail. I think, you know, it's most likely that we're somewhere in between the extremes. We probably don't go back to where we were pre-COVID-19, but it is the case that some folks will go back um, to grocery that have uh, used online purchases while they were um, at home social distancing for COVID-19. So, you know, this changes how things happen in the value chain, how things get packaged, how things get um, uh, warehouse, then and, and when the last mile becomes a delivery truck instead of a uh, grocery store, how does, you know, somebody carrying something out of a grocery store to get it home, how does that influence the entire value chain and the way they coordinate to get that product to consumers? So lots of opportunity out there in the food and value chain, and certainly we're excited about uh, um, the future there. 
Um, it might be cliche, but it is still the case that folks need uh, calories. And so food and agriculture will be regarded as essential uh, and will be strong opportunities for um, consistent growth in the sector. Uh, again, appreciate Erna Berry letting us be a part of the conversation. And if you have any questions or want to continue the dialogue, please feel free to email me at the uh, address on the screen. And thanks.